In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious Father, thank you for this day and the opportunity to spend time in your Psalms, your prayer book. Uh, open our hearts and minds this evening to uh, understand all the things that we will read about tonight. And we especially thank you for the rain that you sent to help the farmers. It looks like we could use some more if you would please send some. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to finish Psalm 46 tonight, is I believe what we said. And then we'll start going into Psalm 119. So, what? Where did we leave off last week? I'm terrible about making notes of where we left off. Sorry. That does not surprise me. <laughs> I'm very good at doing that. Yeah, that, that does refer... We able to withstand attacks, and then we got to what, how we got off track was with the tabernacle. Right. As we were talking about Mary's womb being the tabernacle. Right, right, right. Well, as far as quoting... Um, we didn't get to the stronghold part. Okay. As far as uh, quoting what God says, that the precedence of that is... Um, God expects us to repeat back to him the words he gives us. So, I mean, that's why Jesus gave us the Lord, Lord's Prayer. Okay. Um, and actually our liturgy, also, uh, just about every word of our liturgy, no matter what you pick, divine service one, two, three, four, five, doesn't matter, morning prayer, evening prayer, all that is drawn right from scripture. So all we're doing is paraphrasing, and again, we're saying back to God the words that he gave us. And that, that's what he expects. So it's actually as simple as that. Um, as far as the, I looked up the, the striving, you know, cease striving is what I've got in NASB. Uh, what has it got, what have you got in your Bible in verse 10? It's like, built, be still, I think. Oh, I'm sorry, 46. As I think, yeah, so yeah, be still. Uh, like I said, mine says cease striving. And basically the literal translation of the Hebrew there is, Quit trying so hard, yeah. literally. I have let go relax in my notes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's literally what that Hebrew means there, is, you know, quit trying so hard. You know, don't overstress yourself. And just relax. I'm God. I've got this, basically. Which is, you know, beautiful. Why do I feel like that's Ina? Who is it? Oh, okay. Hello. Oh, that took me long enough to find the page. Okay, that is 11. Getting there. Certainly, certainly. I mean, the Holy Spirit is never not with you. He's there all times. Um, and sometimes, the, the reason God gives us the words to say is because sometimes we don't have the words. You know, sometimes you don't know what to say, what to think, what to pray. Uh, 
which I guess this is a little bit of an aside, but we're ta in talking with people about prayer um, and trying to find a time sometimes can be difficult to get in the habit of praying daily or more than once a day. And I like in the car when you're driving and you don't have to say anything out loud. You're just like, okay, I don't know what to say, but I'm thinking about, you know, Beatrice who's having surgery tomorrow. So I just thought about Beatrice having surgery tomorrow and God understood what I meant. You don't actually have to say, okay, dear Heavenly Father, I'm praying for Beatrice who's having surgery tomorrow. He already knows it's there. Like, uh, you know, scripture says, you know, before the word is on my tongue, Lord, you know what's in my heart. You know what word, you know what I'm praying for. Uh, so before you even think about it, he already knows what you want to pray for. So that's actually extremely comforting when you don't know what to say or, you know, if you see, say you have two people who are having trouble with something, either one person is struggling with like addiction or something and uh, they're, it's putting a strain on their marriage and you just don't know what to pray because you're afraid you're going to, you know, if I pray for him, for her struggle, Am I leaving her short and you're struggling with that in your head and God sorted all that out? You just prayed for it. You didn't formally say the words, but he got it. And I find that extremely comforting to know that he knows what's on your mind. He knows what you're trying to get across and he assures you that he's going to do what, you, what is best according to his will, of course. But that he assures you he hears you, even if we don't have eloquent words to say. And sometimes I think our prayer of the church on Sunday can be a little ugh, too much. And, and sometimes we're saying, you know, you know, God, you sent your servant Elijah to do this and so forth. It's like, I think God knows that <laughs> he did that, you know, like, why do we do it? Because it's so formal and it's so, uh, it has a pattern and a structure. And sometimes I don't think we need all that at times. But. Sure, because it teaches. That, that's, the thing. that's probably why they do it, uh, is because everything we do in church teaches. So if you're not paying attention, because say I have a terrible sermon, and it's just going, you're like, mm, okay. But the words of a hymn, the, the, the God is going to work through that hymn to put his word inside you. Or one of the readings, maybe we have a bad lector one day, and you didn't get something from it, but other days... I, I didn't get, I wasn't paying attention during confession, but there's a reading about confession. You go, oh yeah, I need to, I need to confess this. Uh, you know, there's so many things in the service that can get God's word into you, even if you're not paying attention to all of it. And I think we maybe go overboard with it at times, but other times that's why, that's why we do it. That's why it's historically, since day one, since the first century, why we've done that. Uh, I was going to say something else. But yeah, everything, everything in the service is designed to get God's word into us somehow. And that, that's why there's so many ways to have your sins forgiven. You know, because scripture tells us and the catechism teaches us that, that you know, God sends his word out. It will not return to him empty. It will do the purpose for which he sent it. One of the reasons is word and sacrament forgive sins. So we have confession and absolution at the beginning. And that forgives your sins. And listening to the word being read to you forgive sins and of course the sacrament of the altar forgive sins and the sermon forgives sins because you're hearing god you know jesus died on the cross for your sins there's for words of absolution in the sermon words of absolution in the prayers words of absolution in everything so there's all these opportunities to have sins forgiven and it's wonderful you know so even if we're not always paying attention those opportunities for forgiveness are there. God is delivering that to us in so many different ways. So I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Why don't you do it a sermon on that? I don't think most people know that. You could probably do that. Yeah. I gotta write that down. Forget. That would make an excellent sermon. We could do that. You know what? That'll be for Holly's confirmation sermon. That's what we'll talk about. Thank you. Now I have a topic. <laughs> Well, yeah, because because we were been talking about that kind of stuff, and we're all still in the learning stage. We're always in the learning stage. So, yeah, that's one of the things when when my wife was going through uh, adult confirmation uh, to become Lutheran, and and she said so, and, and that was one of the things she found was so interesting because. 
She said, oh, so you have all these opportunities to get your sins forgiven in the same service. Yes. Like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, because a lot of other denominations don't have that or, or don't teach it or don't make it clear. Um, they may. We're it depends. It yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we don't do a great job of teaching certain other things, too. So it's not Lutherans have it perfect. But uh, Yeah, and things go... It sounds horrible to say, but things fall in and out of fashion in the church. So, you know, I preach about the Lord's Supper all the time. I'm always talking about communion because that's a very strong part of my education. You know, it's drilled into us, you know, talk about the sacrament. The generation before it was baptism. That's all they talked about was baptism a lot. And uh, just certain things uh, kind of fall to the front when when. They teach, you know, they go through phases, just like anything, uh, which isn't right, but it happens. Uh, and like I said, right now, it's, it's all about sacraments and talking about it all the time, which is good because it should, but there's balance too. We should talk about all things all the time. But, and that's, that's probably why Luther preached through the catechism all the time during the weekday services, because uh, he didn't just preach on Sundays. You fell out of bed and the church is right there. So before you went out to the field or whatever, you would go to a quick, it wasn't the full service with the Lord's Supper and all the bells and whistles. It was just a real brief service. And they would have a very brief, usually off the cuff sermon. It was about a part of the catechism or one of the Ten Commandments or something from the Old Testament in the morning. And uh, then they would do that with children. Uh, in the afternoon, they had a, a service of prayer and preaching that was you know, instructing young people in the faith which we don't do that anymore because we just have Sunday and we're lucky we get here on Sunday because everybody's so busy. So again, like see, things fall out of fashion, right? But could you imagine trying to do that today? Because you ever you have to drive to get to your church. It's not right there. Okay. And then the water imagery you wanted to talk about, right? Um, it's in my notes, that's all. Okay. There's a river who's Right. Yeah, and that is, um, that's actually in several other Psalms too. Uh, that's in Psalm 36 and 65. It's in Isaiah, and of course we talked about Revelation 22. Uh, so yeah, that water imagery is big uh, in the Old Testament because it points forward to uh, uh, the baptism that Christ instituted. And then, you know, and then the baptism of repentance that John the Baptist uh, was proclaiming. So you have a lot of water imagery and a lot of washing imagery in the Old Testament. Uh, the most important one is probably, well, no, they're all important. You know, the flood is, is probably literally the largest. So water purifies. So water washed the face of the earth from sinful men. And it was just no one in his family left. Uh, and of course, the, the biggest baptism imagery is uh, the Exodus. So the people of Israel, the Red Sea parted, and the people of Israel passed through the water. Uh, and the literal imagery in the New Testament when they first started baptizing in churches is they would have, uh, you can look at a lot of these old churches that they, they still have um, structure left that they've discovered. Or uh, big churches that are still around to this day, like the one in Florence, has a baptistry next door to the cathedral. And that's called the baptistry because that's where they do baptisms. And you'll see uh, stairs leading down into the pool and it's shaped like a cross for the symbolism. But you would walk down, you would be baptized, and then you would come up from the water. Uh, so you have that, that same image you have in the Exodus of going down in the water and you come out the water a new person with new life. Take off of the bulls of purification outside the temple? Could be too, yep. Yeah, in fact, that, that word, um, the, our word baptism, baptizo in Greek, uh, means washing. It it's, means nothing other than that. And the, in uh, Jewish law, the oral law, uh, there's all kinds of regulations about washing. And that's one of the things you'll see in the New Testament. They, all these rules they had of washing the dining couches and washing vessels. And when Jesus turned water into wine in John 2, uh, the wedding at Cana, uh, the big stone jars that held, you know, about 60 gallons, he said, uh, there's like four of them, that those were basins for the ceremonial washing water, for washing all these things to, to purify things. Uh, 
then you have the same uh, imagery on the last, uh, Monday, Thursday, when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And of course, Peter, you're not doing that. And then he goes, 180, oh, well, wash by my head and my hands also. And he goes, no, you're already clean. Only your feet need to be clean. So you have all that washing imagery, and it all points either backward or forward to baptism, uh, washing of regeneration. Mm-hmm. As opposed to the full immersion baptism or the sprinkling. Sure. That's the uh, initial, I believe, in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Is that, is that how we're supposed to understand it? Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. Um, yeah, as far as, you know, like how much water is enough. In the ancient church, you got dunked. I mean, you, you went down into this pool and came back up. Um, uh, and actually, you were naked. So that's also why they had a separate building for that. You didn't, it wasn't public. Uh, but yeah, you had no clothes on, and you went down to this pool and came out, and then you received the white garment to, symbol, sim, to symbolize purity, the, the cleaning. Uh, so no, it doesn't matter how much water you use or how you do it. Uh, that's one of those things we would call adiaphora, things neither commanded nor forbidden. Mm-hmm. Jesus didn't say how much water to use. He just said, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we do it. Um, and you know, that's why in the Lord's Supper, what kind of wine? What kind of bread? Doesn't say. Doesn't matter. You know, it can be unleavened bread. It can be leavened bread. It can be a big loaf. It can be the little, the little wafers. Doesn't matter. Doesn't say. It just says he took bread and he took wine. And it is my body and it is my blood and we eat and drink it. So we're the ones that put all the ceremony and the add-ons to it. And then each different church has its traditions, and they're all, they're all good. They're neither commanded nor forbidden. You're free. It's what we call in Christian freedom. You can do what you want. Uh, do you have to have a pipe organ, or can you have uh, other instruments? It doesn't say. I mean, we're not, we're not held to, oh, it must be a pipe organ. No, I mean, we've always done a pipe organ. That's... That's what we do. But yeah, there's nothing that says you can't have guitars or, or praise band or what have you. Um, it's not commanded or forbidden. And so the kind of water in the... Uh, look at the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, I think it is. Right? It's right. So here's water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? The answer is nothing. Not a thing. You know, it can be dirty ditch, ditch, ditch water. It does not matter. So that goes back to verse 10 again. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Very good. Yeah. 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 And God, uh, and then, you know, God continues speaking. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. You know, so relax. I got this. And then our response in that last verse, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Okay, and we did talk about the last time, you know, how cities under siege, the thing you would do is cut off their water supply, right? And then, you know, this psalm is teaching us that God is our, our uh, strength, our source of uh, spiritual water. And yeah, that image of a river, that is all through, all through scriptures. And then that, that verse 10, that's the, you know, that's the constant reminder that we need, that God's in control. You know, as much as we would like to exert our will, and as much as we do have things to do on this earth, you know, it's, you know, it's not like the, the country song, Jesus, take the wheel. If you take your hands off the wheel, um, you're probably going to crash. 
you know, God doesn't necessarily, it's kind of testing God. We don't put God to the test. But um, if you are going to die in a car crash, that's God's will. That's how the way you are, have been chosen to go out. Um, if you were to live to be 150, you're going to live to be 150 because that's, that's the number of days he's put for you. He's in control. Um, and most importantly, you know, we can't save ourselves. You know, we can't save ourselves from hell. Only he can do that for us. Uh, and that's why we need the reminder, God's got the big picture covered, but he's also got the little picture covered. So we're anxious about, you know, like Jesus said to, to Martha, you know, you're anxious about many things. Is it Martha or Mary? Yeah. It was Martha. You know, you're anxious about so many things, your sisters pick the bigger portion. It's like, but, 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 no, no. no. again, relax. Yeah, because we're especially modern people. We are really good at getting wound up tight about stuff. Um, and it's hard to let it go. It's hard to relax. Um, any other questions about that psalm or anything you want to talk about before we move on? Because we're going to be in this other psalm for a while. <laughs> it's, I think it's the longest chapter in the Bible, actually. Yeah. Question, concern, I guess. Sure. You know, with what's going on with this pandemic and so on. Mm -hmm. And everyone is being encouraged to do four things to help prevent it. I'm really interested in knowing why there are none of the religious groups on television telling people that God's in control. Mm -hmm. Well, they're probably not going to let them. They're, not going to they're probably not going to let them do that. Um, I think, you know, I mean, I think if, if the Pope wanted to do some big message, they would put that on there because, you know, he's the Pope. Uh, are you going to see President Harrison, you know, the president of our Senate? Is he, is he, are you going to see him on TV? Probably not. They're not, no. you know. But, yeah, like, why are local church leaders not coming together and saying that, I, I don't know. I can't answer that. Um, you just don't see that. And it's probably a shame, but... I've seen Franklin Graham on... Uh, there's a uh, RFD TV, which is more farm or rural oriented, and he, he has a commercial. In fact, he has two different commercials that come on uh, occasionally. But, you know, I'm sure that if Billy Graham was still alive, he'd be... Yeah, I would say you're probably right you know, about some that. Some big name. Even Joel Osteen. Most people know Joel Osteen. We may not always agree with him, but... Well, he's a dynamic guy, yeah. If he said he wanted to talk to people about that, I'm sure they'd let him because he's famous enough. Maybe that's what it is, is, you know, if they have a big enough following like that that they would they would put him on there. Um, I What I would wish there was more of is... You have because so many conservatives are Christians, uh, but they're really bucking against like wearing masks. Like I'm not wearing one right now because you won't be able to hear what I say. Sorry, but we're far enough away. I think that's okay. But you know, like the governor has said that we should be wearing masks in public, and that's probably a good idea. Um, but people are just going to outright go, you know, I'm an American. I have freedom. I'm not doing this. And, you know, biblically, um, that's not right. You know, we have a fourth commandment obligation to our leaders to obey them unless they're being tyrannical. That's different. Uh, you know, the Bible says, you know, honor your father and mother. What does this mean? You know, who is my father and mother? It's anybody God has set authority over you. Um, so if it's, you know, if it's killing people, then the, yeah, you, there's civil disobedience for that. But but this is like what's going on on the West Coast and people just saying, I'm not doing that. Um, no, we probably owe it to our leaders to, to listen um, within yeah, reason. facts on, their, on the evening news that, uh, about that said that they were talking about the amount of people that want to, who are willing to express their opinion mm -hmm. about what's going on. Yep. And when it came to the Republicans, said that 77% of them don't want to express their personal opinions. 
There is that too. Because of the nonsense that's going on with the media. They didn't come out and say that. Right. Uh, you know, they just, there's this cancel culture and one thing and another, or even those commentators on there. They're, yeah. One of them came right out today and said that he, he holds 15% of his opinion back because he wants to keep his job. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, and like I'm not allowed to have a public political opinion either. Yeah. But I mean, that is also a kingdom of the luck thing. We can lose our tax exempt status if all of a sudden you get political, particularly in the pulpit they're talking about. But, but yeah, I mean, so the, again, that's cr Christian freedom. You are you are free to do a lot of things, but but disobeying your leaders just for the sake of being contrary is not one of them. Now, for well reasoned reasons, that's different. So. That's not a simple answer to anything that's going on right now, but but we do owe, owe our leaders obedience. Uh, you know, even Jesus said, "Render under Caesar what is Caesar's," and that's what, exactly what he was talking about. Okay, well, if there is nothing else, we'll move on to one nineteen, and that's going to be a little bit of background material tonight. Because there are things, uh, Psalm 119 is what's called an acrostic. So the, uh, the opening letters in Hebrew, which I can't read, I freely admit that, uh, uh, form uh, little messages on acrostics. And I don't know what the one on this psalm is, but I do know that every section, there is a section for every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So you'll see some Bibles will have that. They'll have Aleph, Bet, Gimel, uh, the letters going through the whole section. And as part of our introductory material tonight, because uh, Luther has quite a bit to say, as always, he has quite a bit to say about a lot of things. There is... Uh, Luther's, uh, what's called a hermeneutical method, and hermeneutical is just a fancy theological word for biblical interpretation. Uh, so exegesis, uh, exegetical work is, is uh, interpreting and translation work, so like working in the Greek texts to write a sermon or whatever. Um, that's exegetical, but hermeneutical is like a more broad, just biblical interpretation. Um, Oh, no, no, that goes back to we can read all of the church fathers, including the, the like the disciples of the apostles. We have their well, some of their writings and they all do it. That's just a, a thing theologians do. Um, but one thing uh, for hermeneutical. Uh, it's uh, Martin Luther's instructions for studying theology. Uh, and then also his uh, kind of prayer life. So we're going to talk about um, some of the overarching themes in Psalm 119 and how they kind of help us shine a lens on how we read the Bible. And Luther had for, for lay people uh, a three-pronged method of uh, basically going through life, to be honest. And that was called uh, Horatio, I've got to get this right. I forgot the third one. That's good. Good job, Steve. It was, oh, right. So it's Horatio, Meditatio, and Tenatio. Tentatio. So Horatio is reading the Bible, but prayer. And then Meditatio sounds like what is meditation. And then Tentatio is trial. So you, you pray, you meditate on the word of God, and then the devil comes poking. And by the poking, you are made stronger. And we'll, we'll talk more on that. And then Luther had this fantastic German word called Anfechtung. And it's one of those great German words that do not translate. But it basically means uh, it's this sense of anxiety, this sense of angst, uh, this sense of uh, being uh, under the devil's attack and under the attack of your own mind, which we're really good at that where you just get inside your head and you struggle and it's this kind of disaffection feeling. Um, again, like the word doesn't translate into English, 
perfectly, but we get it. We get what that ugh, feeling is. Like you're just, something's out to get me and it might be myself. That's exactly what that is. Uh, tentatio, T-E-N-T-A-T-I-O, -E tentatio, trial. Because he wrote all this stuff in Latin. So the first one is oratio, O-R-A-T-I-O, and that is prayer. Not really a direct translation, but in English, we've always called it prayer, meditation, and trial. And they are uh, kind of crucial elements for, for reflecting on the Bible, and they are... Um, they really the basis for studying the Bible according to, to Luther. Uh, this is kind of the process he went through. So we can look at the Psalms. So David is really good for crying out to God for understanding the word. You know, Lord, I love your word. I love your law is one of the big themes we'll see in this Psalm and many others. So he cries out to God for understanding. That's prayer. That's a ratio. And then he thinks about it. Okay, so he is writing the Psalms. He's thinking about it. He is seeking to understand it so he can apply it. That's the meditation. And then he talks about how he is being uh, oppressed by enemies, by difficulties, by sin. That's the trial. That's the tentatio. So we see in David's life how he is being afflicted and what he's doing with that. Uh, so that would be that would be the trial. Uh, so we see that in the Psalms, and we see that in Luther's right, life. So it's a so Psalm one nineteen is going to be a prayerful approach to studying the Word of God, not just the Psalm, but all of it. Uh, for example, Psalm one nineteen five, and we're not starting the Psalm yet, so don't worry about it. But Psalm one nineteen five, David is talking to God, Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes," which he says that in one way or another in many, many psalms. And then Psalm 119.10, with my whole heart I seek you, let me not wander from your commandments. 119.12, blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. And then 119.17-20, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I'm a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. And it goes on like that. And then there's other verses that talk about the meditative approach. So 119.11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Or 119.13-16, with my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. And he has more of that type. And then you see the trials as being something that is also key. Uh, 119, 23, and 24. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They're my counselors. Or 119, 28. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. And we'll see other uh, things like that. Uh, just an interesting aside, and I'm glad I didn't have him as a professor, but uh, do, does everybody know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer is? Okay, so he was a Lutheran pastor, and he was executed by the Nazis. He was actually here in America, and then he went back, and they said, you know, Dietrich, if you go back, you know they're going to kill you, because I have to go back to my flock. So he goes back, and the Nazis put him to death. But one of the things he did for his theology students is he made them memorize Psalm 119. All of it. All of it. Uh, I wonder how many people would not have gone to seminary if they knew that ahead of time. But because of the same thing, because he read Luther, because uh, this basic ability, this basic uh, theological method of learning to study the Bible that you get from a real dedicated study of the psalm and these three three keys that Luther had, the, the, you know, the reading the word, meditating on the word, and then uh, applying it to your life as you go through trials. So, one of the problems in our society today is a lot of people don't pray. Uh, and we may not 
uh, present company accepted, but a lot of people just do not have regular prayer time. Um, they usually may only pray to God when it's time to ask God for something. And I will admit I've fallen into that trap too. It's like seemed like all of a sudden the only time I'm asking God is when I'm in trouble and I need to ask him for a favor. And then you realize, you know, you're, that that's not fair, even though that's what God expects. He expects you to come to him when you need something. Uh, but, you know, having that regular prayer time and regular time in the word is, you know, makes your life better, <laughs> makes your life a lot better. But a lot of people uh, don't necessarily do that all the time. And admitting that you depend on somebody else, even a all-powerful spiritual being like God, doesn't sit right with a lot of people. That's like, well, you know, I have to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. It's an American thing. Is you know, other countries are, are like that, but that's a real American thing. Is you know, we're self-made people. I, you know, I didn't take nothing from nobody. I, what I have, I got by hard work. That's about as American as it can get. That's the American dream, right? Is to come to this country and work really hard and be successful. And you did it. Uh, you know, that's when my people came here two generations because a lot of people have been here since the beginning. I'm only second generation. My grandparents came here off the boat and that's what they did. Okay, we don't speak German in the house. It'll be English from now on, and boom, and that's it. And because we're in America, and that's what you do. And they worked hard, and so on. So, uh, yeah, that doesn't sit so right with people that you have to be dependent. You don't want to be dependent on anybody, even God. Uh, and we don't emphasize that in Bible study necessarily. That that our utter dependence on God for everything, because again, He's the one in control. Well, maybe that's another sermon topic to teach. You're probably right. You are probably maybe right. To solve how to do it to remind us. That, you are not wrong. That would, that would be a good one. Um, in case you're wondering where sermon ideas come from, that, this is kind of talking about this and like, oh, yeah, that would be a good sermon. Yeah, that's absolutely where they come from. Uh, even looking at what they teach you in seminary, it's cursory. It's, okay, yeah, this is something you need to do. <clears throat> Read this book. Okay, now let's move on. Okay. Now, are you getting it a little bit when you take your uh, Books of Moses class and you spend Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy in 10 weeks? Did you learn to interpret all those books? No, but you got the basis for it for the rest of your life that you're supposed to be doing. But it's like, that's incredibly fast. And then in 10 weeks, did the prophets, all of them, all the major and minor, all of them in 10 weeks. Then you slow down a little bit and you do a gospel for 10 weeks. And even that's still fast. Like Luke and Acts in 10 weeks. But you hit the high spots and then you learn how to interpret the, the rest of it. But it's, like you said, it's, it like, it's cursory. It's very quick. Um, and you could take more classes about other things and get deeper into it. That, that not don't mean to say, oh yeah, they just kind of knock this into your head real quick. But... This idea that there is a way to read the Bible and a way to learn to take everything out of it. You know, if they're not teaching your pastors that, then how in the world are we going to teach you? But that's this method of Luther's, which permeates all of his writing. If you, and they have many wonderful and inexpensive books of Luther. Uh, to read his whole works, it's, you know, several shelves. But there are, uh, it's called the Essential Luther. It's a little spendy. It's annotated, though. It's very nice. And it's got the key documents that he wrote in his career about uh, church and state, about reading the Bible, uh, about prayer, about all kinds of other things. Uh, the priesthood of all believers that we mentioned, but a lot of people don't understand. What does that mean? We're all priests. Uh, a lot of the basics. And they're very, he's very readable. He's a very down-to-earth guy. Uh, he's pretty funny sometimes too, a little off color, shall we say, earthy is the word they like to use. Um, in translation, it kind of dulls it a little bit, but in the original, it's very earthy. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of Luther you can read. And, and one of the things is about this, how to pray. And Luther wrote a little book called A Simple Way to Pray, which is not that simple. But uh, you can, it, that book itself is only a few pages. It's available from CPH. If you guys are interested, I can make you copies. Um, and in it, it talks about this kind of threefold way. And it talks about how to pray. 
how to go in your room and close the door and get on your knees, and this is what you do. Recite the Ten Commandments, recite the Apostles' Creed, and then go through the Lord's Prayer. And you think, well, that's a lot to do in the morning. Yeah, it is. But here's the trick. And he wrote this for a friend of his. He wrote it for his barber. And it's inscribed, you know, to, I forgot what the barber's name is. Uh, Matthew Harrison, the president of our synod, did the translation, and it's wonderful. But he wrote it for his barber because his barber said, you know, Dr. Luther, how do I pray? How do I do this? And he goes, okay, I'll write. And he wrote this little book. And it's great. So he says, go in and, you know, recite the Ten Commandments. And if you get stuck on one, stop. Because that's what you need to meditate on. So it's like, okay, uh, you know, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy while you haven't gone to church very regularly. And what's the next commandment? Stop. Because that was what you need to be focused on because that's what you need to pray about. Or you're saying the Lord's Prayer even, you know, and you get to, uh, and lead us not into temptation. And you start thinking about, well, you know, that, you know, the tart at the village inn was looking at me and, you know, I shouldn't have like winked back because I'm married and, and oh yeah, that's a sin. That's sin against, right? So I need to concentrate on that temptation that I'm, I'm falling for. I need to, oh, which means I need to think about the sixth commandment now. So that's what he says. If you get caught on something, just stop, pray, say amen and move on because you got to the root of what you need to be praying about. Uh, so yeah, if you do the whole thing, it might take you 10 minutes, but maybe you spend 10 minutes thinking about the thing you actually need to be talking to God about. Uh, so it's a neat little book. And you know, then he explains all the parts. It's almost like a mini catechism. So it's, it's a pretty neat little thing. But it goes through then, okay, so here's the scripture that goes with that. So here's the, here's the reading the word, and here's the meditation, except the meditation came first. And then, okay, well, I know what the temptation is because I found it because that's what I got stuck on and I need to be thinking about. And we can do that today if you're praying in your car. You're just thinking, okay, I'm thinking through the Ten Commandments and this is the one I'm, I'm hooked on, or a petition in the Apostles' Creed, or a petition in the Lord's Prayer. I, I stuttered on that because that's what I need to be focused on, and then I'm, in, I'm done. Uh, and then he also talks about this when you need to pray about something that God is... He knows what you're trying to say. But that, but that is the thing we need probably to teach better is, is this how to read the Bible. I'm thinking about another a thing is, you know, if we outright reject the fact that we're dependent on God, then we outrightly reject that prayer has any value, uh, which is something we could do to teach our neighbor better, or sometimes our children if they've wandered, to uh, know, you know, prayer does have value, and this is the value in it. Uh, that, you know, it's important to read the Bible because the Bible covers so many things. It covers everything. You know, Jesus really taught his disciples how to pray before they said, Jesus teaches how to pray, and he gave him the Lord's Prayer, because what was Jesus always doing? Going off by himself, praying all night, which, yeah, we're not doing that, probably, but Jesus had a lot of things to pray about, didn't he? But, you know, even the Son of God was all night in prayer to his Father, so he taught his disciples how to pray because they saw him doing it all the time. Uh, you know, kind of like... Uh, you know, questions you can ask a professor is like, how are you able to read so much? How do you have time to write so much? Jesus, how do you have t the ability to pray so much? You know, um, you know, Jesus, when he was, kept, when the, the disciples of 72 came back later, later when, uh, I think it was when he sent out the 12 first, and they came back and they said, you know, we couldn't cast this demon out. And Jesus says, oh, yeah, well, that one can only be cast out by prayer. And that's going to be a, probably one of our hard sayings of Jesus' sermons is, well, I'm sure they prayed over him. How come their prayer didn't work? So, uh, you know, everything is by the power of prayer. And then texts, biblical texts that talk about the Spirit. You know, Lutherans at one time, maybe even still today, got accused of not really preaching about the Holy Spirit. And I don't know why, because we talk about them all the time, in my opinion. But 
Uh, for some reason, they thought about Lutherans didn't preach about the Holy Spirit, um, which is wrong. You know, uh, people have difficulty when you say, well, you know, the Spirit revealed that to me. You know, okay, modern people are maybe going to have a little trouble with things like that. Or, you know, I didn't know what to say, so I prayed about it, and God gave me the words to say. Modern people, like, huh? And that's a shame. You know, that's, again, people don't understand the value of prayer, the value of prayer in your life. Oh, and that can, can God really do that? Well, yeah, God can do anything, right? Uh, so, so sometimes non-believers are not going to quite get what we're talking about with that the Bible is teaching us this stuff, that's teaching us about prayer. Um, but that's because the unbeliever has other problems we have to address before we get there necessarily. But even we Christians sometimes can forget the, the power and importance of prayer. And that the Holy Spirit is there when you're reading. I mean, you are given the Holy Spirit when you're reading the Bible. It doesn't necessarily mean he is going to give you insight into its meaning necessarily. Uh, but he is being given to you uh, through the reading itself. Sure. You know, and that is the big thing about the last of the three, three things in Luther's uh, idea of prayer and, and reading the Bible is the, the temptation, the trial. Uh, because you're not going to necessarily understand it until you've gone through it. Uh, which is one of the beautiful things about Christ, because when he became incarnate and grew up from being a baby... You know, he grew up through life. He's seen every kind of temptation and trial, so he lived it. You know, so he, when you pray to him, he absolutely understands where you're coming from because he did it. He went through it, and then some, which is part of the reason why he had to become a person. You know, he had to live our life, and, but not succumb to the temptation and sin. So interpreting the Bible, that's something, and understanding the Bible, that's something that takes our whole life. You know, someone... And never, never got all the way there with this fellow, but it was a fellow I used to work for. And he asked me one day, he goes, how many times are you going to read that book? And I said, I'll be reading that book over and over for the rest of my life because it's all, you're never going to understand all of it. You know, and it, it, he was starting to ask the right questions and he had the right, you know, he saw things in nature that pointed him to a creator, but he never quite made that step. Uh, but his son did. And his son got his kids baptized and started going to church regularly. So, you know, the Holy Spirit does, does do things in his own time and way. Uh, but that, that is the idea of the oratio. So that is the, that is the, the, the prayer. Now the meditation is the next step. And that is... Because we don't reflect on things. This is one of the, the, modern, the modern thing working against the meditatio is that we're always in a hurry and we don't pause to reflect on things anymore. Um, we don't... Uh, like a lot of people will, will set themselves a schedule and try to read through the whole Bible in a year, which is a worthy thing to do. Uh, but... They read it, but they don't reflect on it then. So it's like, yeah, you read it, but you didn't dig into what it's about necessarily. Uh, and actually there was a, a Lutheran uh, theologian that wrote a method of theological study for pastors, but it's, it's good for, to a point, it's good for, for lay people too. And what he said was, yes, you read through the Bible every year, but then you read through one book a year. Mm -hmm. And what for pastors, he says, is you read through that one book, or if it's a short book, you do a couple of them. But say you're going to do a gospel, spend a year on that gospel, and when you're done, you have a commentary on that gospel. Because it's verse by verse, go to the Greek, read what Luther wrote, read what the church fathers wrote about that book, read the commentaries, 
come up with your own notes, and when you get done, you'll have a commentary on the book. Uh, and we can do that too. Is you know, pick a book to dig into, like so what we do in Bible study. We're doing books of the Bible, uh, but even then, you go too fast. You, you don't you don't go into that kind of detail. But on your own, you like get a commentary that you like and and read that book of the Bible with that commentary, and it'll take you a while. It'll take about a year. And, you know, if you think about it, if we go through a book of the Bible like we did the Gospel of John, it was about twenty six weeks. We spent six months in it. And I think we still didn't quite finish it because I don't know what happened. Um, so often we think that pray we have to sit down and get ourselves all situated right. And um, then we're going to have this form formal prayer. We're going to pray. Mm -hmm. See, I, I don't do that. I do more prayer as talking. Yep, yep. And, and, and many times they're simple. I don't need to explain everything to the Lord. Right, because he knows it already, right? And, but I like to let him know, hey, you know, I am thinking of what I can do. And, or sometimes it's only for word. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Or, um, Lord, why did you let this happen to me? You know, this kind of. Sure. Um, yeah, mine's always short because um, no, I think if, if you when you down and no, it's not going to happen. Um, you know, and that's why we said you know it's just as soon as the thought crossed your mind, you prayed for it. Yeah. You know, so right. that that's enough. And, and and Luther advocates that too. Go in your room, shut the door. You know, put down the phone. He would say today probably. And just do it, but it doesn't have to be this big production. You know that. You know we do that in church because it's liturgy. We have a way we do things, uh, and we do it the same way every week. But sometimes in church, so you know, it's kind of lengthy. Yeah, when the prayer of the church is too long, you've stopped paying attention to it. You got a long ministry, you know, you go on and on and on. Yeah. So often, if it's too long, we kind of. No, you're absolutely right. That is absolutely true. You know, and then I can't help but also think, you know, like, who are you trying to impress? You know, you think about the story of, you know, the Pharisees standing on the... Yeah. The Pharisees love to pray on the street corners because everybody sees them, yeah. and that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you pray, Jesus says, go in your room, shut the door. Uh, yeah, it's whatever works for you. Whatever works for you to get your prayer time in. Uh, so that you're at least talking to God, and we need to remember, like you said, it's a conversation. Uh, you know, it's, it's, he's there to listen. He's your father. He's there to listen. And when he answers, it's going to be in his way because he's your father. It'll be in his way, in his time, and it might not be the answer you want, but it will be answered. And he promises you that. But uh, Luther said about reading the Bible but not reflecting on it, he said, uh, and take care that you do not grow weary or think that you have done enough when you've read, heard, and spoken the words of Scripture once or twice, that you have complete understanding. Um, and it, because if you do that, it, you'll be like untimely fruit which falls to the ground that's only half ripe. You know, so it's one of those things like don't ever think you understand it completely, but don't just read it and then not think about what it meant. Like, why... Why is this in the Bible is a question we can ask sometimes. Like talking to young couples, it's like we talk about Song of Songs. Why is this in your, because I encourage them the weeks before the wedding to go home and read it together. And you're going to ask yourself a question, why is this in the Bible? Because <laughs> it's, okay, it's a man talking about how hot his wife is. <laughs> Literally, because it's Solomon talking about how beautiful his bride is. Well, that's why the couples are reading it. And they say, okay, now read it together like that as a couple, because this is a model for marriage. Now go back and read it from the beginning after you do it the first time and remember the husband is Christ and the woman is the church. Now read it again and you're going to look at it a completely different way that it's all about Jesus. Uh, and it is. And it's, you know, it's a tough book to read. But, um, and you wonder like, why is this in the Bible? Well, that's why it's in the Bible. It's all about Jesus. Um, why is... I don't know, what's something that we ask why? Why is some of that weird stuff in Ezekiel in the Bible? You know, the visions. Because it points forward to Jesus coming again. 
Uh, it all points, all, all, everything inevitably the answer is always Jesus. It points either forward or backward to Christ. Uh, but just, just reading it in a rush and not thinking what it's about is not having any benefit for you. Unless you're really good at memorizing and you always can spit chapter and verse out. I'm sorry, what? Uh, we might wonder what the Lord is trying nowadays with the Bible. Going crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and and really, I always I feel kind of like the, the religious part of our country. It's pretty quiet. But yeah. Pray. I mean, I'm not just talking about Lutheran, everybody. Everybody, yep. Um, are they out there marching? Um, I said, I said, or what I feel like doing when they raise, they have these signs and they walk around, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, and then I, I feel like I should, I want to walk behind with a sign, All Lives Matter, Christ died for all. And, and that's true. I, and I heard, I heard a really not to go political, but I heard a really good speech the other day, and he said, okay, when you're when we're marching Black Lives Matter and you walk behind me with a sign that says All Lives Matter, you defeat you you just took you just took the wind out of their movement. Yeah. Because yeah. that's true, all lives matter, but at the moment, Black Lives Matter, because that's the problem. And he had a very good point with that, I thought. And you know, that's the other thing is and this is a similar thought, is okay, we're having these riots about, you know, race inequality in this country, which yeah, because it's there. If you die, it's there. You have your head in the sand. And then another pastor got up and goes, oh, yeah, well, they have this, you know, that, that people need, you know, cops need to stop shooting people. But at the same time, here's a headline that this abortion clinic is now back open and still okay to have babies. Or uh, still okay to kill babies. And I'm a big right to life for both the old and the young. And that's true. But, you know, at the moment... This is what needs to be talked about. And yes, we still need to, you know, march on abortion clinics, but time and place, every movement can't be about all things. So, but yes, you know, a lot of groups are silent. A lot of groups are just saying, you know, I'm staying out of this because for whatever reason. Uh, and then Jesus said that you will hear of wars and rumor of wars. You'll wonder if the time is now, you know, that the end is here. And you look around and go, yeah, all the signs are here. Like, this, is this it? Is he coming soon? You know, come Lord Jesus. Luther thought the same thing in his life, that the end has got to be coming in my lifetime. Uh, when the Lutherans came to America, there was a fellow, Winniken, one of the founders of our seminary, and he thought that the end was now. It's coming. All the signs are there, and the signs have been there since Jesus ascended into heaven, and the signs will keep being there, and that was his point, until he returns. You're not going to know when. Because you're always going to have these things. The poor will always be with you. Okay, so we're going, to have, we're going to have this kind of stuff. It just seems to be a lot of it right now, and this too shall pass. But, yeah, you wonder, is this it? Is this really it? Maybe this is it. Maybe. But we're, we, no, we don't know. We don't know. So all of these things, you know, is it, is it wrong for a Christian to... to put their neck out on some of these issues? Absolutely not. I mean, I think Jesus would have marched in some of these marches. It's, these are things that need to be said. Uh, these are things that are supposed to unite us, not divide us. Uh, and then I got kind of stopped without getting political, but... I mean, you see that, you see Jesus doing that in the New Testament. You know, he's, he's preaching to, you know, to uh, uh, Canaanites and to Samaritans because his own people rejected him, Right? And you see Paul do the same thing. He's, you know, he's preaching to some Jews in the book of Acts. And he goes, you're not listening to me, so I'm going back to the Greeks. And, you know, see ya. Because you know, some folks just don't want to listen, but it doesn't mean you ever stop saying it. Even if nobody's listening, you don't know that. You never know when your words are having an effect in somebody's life. You'll, you'll not know until we're in heaven. Sure. Absolutely. You know, and the, you know, I went through this with some discussions with a few folks. You know, nobody, nobody here. Um, 
but asking why so many prisoners all of a sudden find Jesus. And that's the, he did the eye roll and the head shake. He's like, how come all these prisoners find Jesus? Because they hit the bottom and they got nowhere else to go? It's like, yeah, you just answered your own question. Well, why? So why not? They finally hit the bottom and realized there is no other way up but God. What is wrong with that? Yeah, that, that exactly, you're exactly right. Why is that a bad thing? You know, like, why do alcoholics find God? Because they hit their bottom and they realize their only way up out of this pit is from God with God's help. What's wrong with that? You know, why is that such a complete shock? Because it was because they ought to be able to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and what we already talked about. And he was the exact same way. He's like, well, you know, I realized I was drinking too much. And it's like, yeah, imagine that. And, you know, when, when I had a child, I stopped. I said, well, good for you. <laughs> That's great. But for other people, they need help. And, you know, either a 12-step program, which they do work, and, and then every part of that 12-step program is find a higher power. You know, uh, whether it is our God or whoever God they pick, but they still realize you need something outside yourself. And that's, you know, the Bible tells you that. The Bible teaches you that. Uh, but, you know, that, again, they don't want to put that trust because that's weakness. And it's like, okay, yeah, but in your weakness, you're strong, which the Bible teaches that too, right? You know, it's weakness that makes you strong. You know, and I mean, even some of our, our Christian books out there that aren't really Christian books because they're not really talking about God, they're self-help books, and they're always about, you know, um, but they talk about the same things, about being always in a hurry and always being in a rush and being stressed out. Uh, but then they stop, even Christian writers stop just short of actually giving you any scripture or even mentioning Jesus. Uh, Olstein's books are like that. He'll never mention the word sin. It's like you have problems and you have difficulties, but he never calls it what it is. He never calls it sin. So there's no call to repentance, which that's fine. I mean, other than that, his books are okay, but there, there's no Jesus died for you because you're a sinner. That, it doesn't quite go there. Not to pick on him, but I, I do love to pick on him. Uh, but, you know, Oprah does the same thing. Uh, Hollywood does the same thing. Uh, the, uh, who is that guy that always did the, with the headset, the motivational? Tony Robbins does that. You know, you pay him a lot of money to hear him talk. Uh, but we have, you know, you get a Bible. Somebody will give you a Bible for free. But you have to know how to read it, which is the point we're making with this. It's great if you have the book and you read the book, but if you don't know what the book means, again, go back to the Ethiopian eunuch. It's a great story. The Ethiopian eunuch, he's reading the book of Isaiah, and he, you know, he's being carried along, and he's reading the book of Isaiah, and he says, hey, who can understand this unless he's taught? And they're like, yeah, that's exactly right. So here, let me tell you what it's all about. And guess what? It's all about Jesus. Okay, how do I get baptized? Let's do this. He's excited, because now he understands his eyes were open to what this means. Uh, same thing, we're going to go through this psalm and it's going to look like there's an awful lot of law because it's always talking about how great the commandments are. But there's gospel in there too and we'll fish it out. But that's what biblical meditation is, is thinking about a text over and over and over. You know, Because if it was just one that simple, you would hear one sermon about it and that would it. You would never preach on that text again because it's been done. Instead of hundreds of guys over thousands of years all talking about the same text and every person gets a little something different and preaches something a little different to a different group of people and they get hopefully something out of it. You know, even if it reaches just one, it did its work. Uh, but... Mm -hmm. Why is it that, and I know you do it, um, that you, if you, you have a text and you, you stick pretty much to that text? Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and why don't you, do, or some other once in a while, get out of your little cage mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and really start zeroing in on some of these matters that are going on? I mean, you can still True. you can still stick to your text of the Bible, mm -hmm. but um, you know, maybe bring some things back back home. Yeah, I gotcha. 
I mean, I've been trying to do that through this whole COVID thing each week, a little something that, that hits on it um, without bludgeoning you over the head with it. Uh, but the reason I, because I'm still new at this, I mean, this is my fourth, or this is only like my second year writing a sermon every week, uh, third year. But I'm actually back on texts I preached my first year now, because the cycle repeated. Um, the reason I stick to the texts is because I know I won't go astray with uh, going too free. Um, so I, I limit myself to the text because I know I'm not going to proclaim anything that's heretical. Uh, that would be really easy to do. That's why I do it. Uh, so yeah, like why, do you, why not a topic, like a topic on prayer, but a, there's still going to be a text that's going to be a text about prayer. You know, you could probably write 100, 300 sermons, 400 sermons on prayer because you won't run out of verses in the Bible about it. But yeah, I mean, that's why I do it. And it's also the way I was taught. But, but yeah, and I mean, you're taught the other ways. You know, you could do dialogue sermons where one guy plays good cop, one guy plays bad cop. And you kind of, some things I think are too cute and I'm not comfortable going there yet. Like Pastor Davis doesn't preach from the text of the day. He just picks a text he wants to preach on. And that's what he's going to preach on. And that's, that's how he does it. So that's different right there. Uh, and that's what I'm doing this summer. I'm not preaching on one of the texts of the day. Uh, I'm doing these difficult sayings of Jesus that I'm going through. Uh, but, but I don't just pick a topic yet. Uh, except like, you know, Christmas, Easter, times like that. Uh, but that's why, to make sure I stay grounded in God's word. Because I'm, I'm too new to go uh, freelancing yet. That's why. But yeah, some people do that. They do free texts and they just, uh, they, they just run with it. And that's all good. It's like um, at Zion, I know they're going this year, this past year, they preached instead of the Gospels because they tell you to preach the Gospel. Like I had one professor, he wasn't a sermon prof writing professor. And he goes, this is how you guys preach. You preach on the Gospel of the day. You will preach on the Gospel of the day. It's like, okay, you know, like breathe. You're going to have a stroke. You, know, you will preach on the Gospel of the day. If you need an illustration, you're not going to pull in some cute story like, why? People like that, you know, because it helps, you know, relate to their own. He goes, no, if you need an illustration, the Old Testament is full of pictures. Use that, which he's not wrong. You do that sometimes. But you will do this. And then, you know, to explain law and gospel, you pull in the epistle. It's like, dude, like, breathe, relax, go have a beer. You need to, wow. <laughs> but he's like super conservative and, and yeah, I'm super conservative too, but wow, guy, I mean, we do have freedom in that, that, you know, like don't preach from the Old Testament text. Like, oh, lighten up, Francis, just stop. But, you know, he said that's the only correct way to do it. Like, and he goes, no, ugh, enough. Yeah, so it, there, it's, there's all kinds of things out there. But yeah, there, there's many and varied ways. I just have one way so far. Pastoral examples that we've heard over forty years of marriage, and, and um, uh, it's been very interesting to see. And we feel drawn personally to people who love the Bible and want to do honor to God's word first and foremost. We do understand the leading of the Holy Spirit, so we're fully prepared. If you go off on a tangent in the pulpit mm -hmm. <laughs> to say something that God shows you to say right then. But God's Holy Spirit, he's not going to lead you into some rabbit trail that's going to be awful and offensive. Right, right. So as long as, as it's done through his Holy Spirit, no matter what it is, it's going to be fine. Yeah, this, this is the way it was explained to us, and this is terrifying when you think about it. And I said, okay, when you preach and properly distinguish law and gospel, and you preach Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins, and you do it right, and you do it from the pulpit, that is the Holy Spirit speaking. And it's like, and I'm not calling a sermon the inspired word of God, but it is like the inspired word of God because it's true to the Bible. But when you screw it up, it's on you. <laughs> it's like, oh, great. <laughs> 
It's like so that kind of it's like oh yeah, it's the inspired word of God. It's like yeah, but when you mess it up, it's all on you, and you're responsible for that. So you go you're going to have to you when you're standing in front of him on the last day, you have to account for that. And it's like that's terrifying, and it brings everybody like everybody was kind of starting to kind of float a little bit, and then it was like boom, dragged you right back to earth, and went yeah okay, but. Yeah, and that, you know, and it's not just for, you know, this stuff is not just for pastors, but pastors need to teach their flock. You have to teach, you know, there is every passage, every section of scripture has law and it has gospel. It has the word of law and the Lord of gospel, and you got to keep them apart because if you mix them up, you messed it up. Um, then you made it about us, what we do for God, and that, that doesn't fly. Uh, and that's what David is going to do through, through the Psalms because he's going to talk about constantly talking about the word, meditating on the word. These are words he uses, speak, sing, hear, read, by day, by night. The one, hymn, the one psalm from our morning evening prayer the other day was, I get up at midnight and praise your, you know, praise your words. Like, I have not ever done that, but he is King David. Uh, but you know that you hear that you know I love your law because it shows me everything, and you know the way to look at that is okay when it's the law, the things I'm supposed to do that I don't do, and the things I don't do that I just said the other way, the things I do I'm not supposed to do. But then sanctification, the Holy Spirit in your life, the, the law becomes a joy because it's the things you get to do for your neighbor, because it's not about you, it's about everybody else. So God's law shows you how to live for your neighbor. Uh, and that's actually Luther, uh, almost word for word said what I just said, because I was reading. Uh, you know, God does not give you his spirit without the word. So he's there, but he's there in his word. That's how God comes to us today. You know, we used to have prophets, now we have the Bible. So, you know, meditating on Scripture is not just reflecting quietly on a passage, although that's part of it, but it's, it does involve, you know, memorizing sometimes or paraphrasing or, or being able to, like, I said a bunch of Scripture verses tonight off the top of my head. Ask me chapter and verse. I can't tell you. Some of them I can, some I can't. You know, I know what chapter they're in. Luther is famous, by the way, for quoting, you know, as it says in, you know, like, in um, you know Matthew chapter three, and it's like Matthew chapter twenty-one. He misquotes what chapter it is all the time. That's not the point. Uh, but speaking of, if you look in James chapter one verse twenty-five, it says, "The man who looks intently into the perfect law, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does." So that's read the word, think about the word, act out the word. Uh, and that's the acting out part that we Christians need to hear about because we don't do it so great sometimes. So, oh, when am I going to have time to read Bibles? Especially I got this when I was teaching uh, high school kids, uh, Sunday school, uh, which was wonderful just to have high school kids in Sunday school. But it's like, well, when am I going to have time for that? It's like, you know, put down Netflix for 20 minutes, like an episode... <laughs> Like an episode of a half hour program without commercials on Netflix is 20 minutes. That's one less episode a day. Go read the Bible. Go read a little bit of the Bible for 10 minutes and think about it. Or read it for 15 and think about it for five. Or read it for 10, think about it for five, and pray for five. Or something. Okay, before you go to bed. It's one episode of TV you got to let go to spend time in the Word. I'll guarantee you, your life will change quickly. Quickly. But that's, when am I going to have time? Got to make time for God. Sorry. Now I'll give you one more Lutheran and then we'll quit because I'm starting to get a little long-winded. And then we'll talk about trial, which is the hard part next week. Um, Luther wrote, I would have been quite content to see my books, one and all, remain in obscurity and go by the board. Among other reasons, I shudder to think of the example I am giving. <laughs> For I am well aware how little the church has been, has been profited since they've begun to collect many books in large libraries in addition to and besides scriptures, and especially since they've stored up without discrimination all sorts of writings by the church fathers, the councils, and teachers. Though this practice not only is precious time lost, which could be used for studying the scriptures, 
But in the end, the pure knowledge of the divine word is lost so that the Bible lies forgotten in the dust under the bench, as happened to the book of Deuteronomy and the times of the king of Judah. Like they discovered the book and all of a sudden they read it. And they're like, well, this is good. Um, but on the other hand, the teaching of the 12 apostles, the book called, it's called the uh, Didache, the teaching of the 12 apostles was lost until the 1800s. And they found a copy of this and it's like, hey, this, this actually should have been in the Bible, but you can't. It's too late to put it in. I mean, technically, it's not too late to ever add anything to the Bible, but it's never going to happen. Uh, it would just be warfare on both sides trying to say, yes, it should, no, it shouldn't. But there's nothing in the teaching of the 12 apostles when you read it that's wrong because one of, some of the 12 apostles wrote this, and it's right out of the Bible. And you can tell the style and everything that it's legit. And it just takes some of the real popular things from the Bible and it might flip the words because that's the way they taught stuff like that. So, you know, there are two ways. You know, the way, capital W, is the way of following Christ. But there is the way of life and the way of death. So you see these contrasts through the whole thing. And it just goes through and it's like a neat little catechism. Uh, but that was lost for almost 2,000 years. And then they discovered it. You know, and I think those things are good. But yeah... If you go reading St. Augustine, who is wonderful, and Luther was an Augustinian monk, he was very familiar with St. Augustine. Augustine, Augustine, depends how you want to pronounce it, doesn't matter. Uh, but if you read some of that stuff without knowing what your Bible says, you can't read all of it like it's good because some of it's not right. It's not accurate. It's not what the Bible says because not all those guys, well, first of all, not all those guys are Luther, right? They, they, it's not perfect. It's not all true. It's not all good. You have to be discerning. Uh, but to say that, that losing all that stuff would be good, eh, no, because it shines light on how to understand some things. How did the first century guys understand this? Because they're the closest to Christ and the apostles. How did they understand this? And you go, oh, that's exactly how we understand it. Great. Uh, the, our Lutheran confessions, which is not the Bible, but it shows us what the Bible says, which is why we subscribe to it, that we subscribe to it as pastors. And you read, they'll quote the church fathers and say, you know, this is what as so-and-so has said because that was like from day one. That stuff is good, but yeah, you know, guys like to read Luther and like, you know, Luther, 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 like every Sunday from the pulpit. No, show me what Jesus said. I don't care what Luther said. Sometimes he has some great quotes. It's good to read, but early Luther? Yeah, no, don't read it because he was still Catholic. He had some, some error in there. Uh, but his books on the Psalms, his first job as a professor, are fantastic. Those poor students, these lectures are long. I mean, really long. But yeah, they're, they're good stuff. And his sermons were really, really long. Uh, Why did Luther pick the Psalms to translate? Uh, he didn't translate them first. He taught them in the university first. I think it was assigned, actually. Um, you know, he was, he was still mucking around being a monk. He had already been to Rome and back, and he was still discontented. The seeds were sown that something's wrong, that this is not, all these things are not right, how we're doing the church. And so his, uh, his father in the, in the uh, monastery says, well, you know, they need a new professor in Wittenberg, and you're it, because if you get out there, and then you get to teach what you think. I, don't quote me on that being a direct quote because, you know, you will teach them what the Bible says. And because they all had them memorized, they prayed those psalms every day, seven times a day. So in a week, they would went, went through and they sang all of them. Uh, he, went, he knew them like the back of his hand. Uh, was teaching in Latin. He wasn't, wouldn't be teaching them from Hebrew uh, because he had, probably hadn't learned Hebrew yet. But he was fluent in church Latin because he had already almost finished law school when he decided to become a monk, which is why his father was so angry with him at first. He was like, this close, and he went, yeah, I'm going to go be a monk. And he's like, you what? I paid for you to do this so I could have a lawyer in the family to help me with business. Uh, they did make up, contrary to what you see in the movies. Uh, they did mend their fences. Uh, but so he would have been able to read the Latin Bible, which is what they taught from perfectly, and read the Old Fathers was all written in Latin. He would be able to do that. Uh, so he knew them very well. It seems logically that you would do the Gospels. Uh, he, at that point, I don't know that he'd ever actually read the New Testament. They didn't, see, they didn't have it. They, I mean, they may have had it, but they didn't read it. 
a lot of those monks never read the Bible. They would read, when you read, when you went to priest school, let's call it, okay, and they would read, and I'm trying, they would read this thing called Lombard Sentences, which you can still take a lecture on it in the seminary today. And it was these sentences, and it's many, many books, and to get a set of it's super expensive because I looked into it, and I'm like, yeah, that's not that interesting. But that's what they studied. And then when you wanted to know what the church believed, they'd point you to this book called Canon Law. And it was this big book, eventually, that they wrote down of all this stuff like purgatory and, and limbo and everything excuse me, everything else, indulgences uh, and, and what, uh, what penances you do for things that they taught, there's no Bible in any of that stuff. So these priests, probably half of them couldn't even read Latin, actually. So Luther had a leg up on that. Uh, most of these guys, they didn't have it, and it wasn't a thing. They just didn't, the, what the church says is what you did. They had complete authority, and the Bible was an afterthought. Nobody read it. You know, it was, there, if there was a Bible, it was chained in the library, and the chains, everybody makes a big deal out of it. So you didn't steal it because it's super expensive. You know, it was, it was like a year's wages for a laborer to have a Bible copied by hand. Uh, it was a lot. And, it, and something like, what is it, 20 animals have to die to have enough vellum? Or is it 40? It's a lot of animals have to die. To, to give their skin to be the pages of one of those. It's super expensive. Uh, and nobody read it. And, and that's shocking to us, I know. But. And it was only when he started actually reading the Bible that he's like, you're saved by faith. There's nothing in there about works. It talks about works, but it talks about works after you're saved. So, and then he just read, that's why they called it rediscovering the gospel because it, it was lost. They were not hearing it. When you went to church, you did not hear the Bible being read, and if you did, it was in Latin, and you couldn't understand it. So, yeah. Uh, so that was, that was when the big awakening started taking place, and then he really got into it when he started translating. Uh, and to put it in perspective, he did the, the New Testament in 10 weeks, or 16 weeks, or 20 weeks. It was a very short period, less than a year. It took him 20 years to finish the Old Testament <laughs> before it got published, so... Yeah, yeah. So these people did not have the Bible. I mean, it was there, but they didn't read it. You know, they read the Psalms, and you can see from reading the Psalms how they start getting. And you read the Old Testament, you hear the stories, and you understand why they thought God was an angry judge, and they assumed Jesus was the same way because they didn't hear about him. Yeah, it was awful. And then their whole life was one of works. It was you know, get up seven times to pray, not because you're pious, but because. You did that to, for God. It was something you did for God. Not that you were getting something from God. Uh, and that was the, the problem with the, the church service in general, like the, the communion liturgy. It was this, called the sacrifice of the mass because they are offering Jesus as a sacrifice to God. So you're offering God to God as a sacrifice, which never made sense to me, but... When you look at the, what they were doing, is you were re-sacrificing Jesus every week, and it was a work. The priest was doing this, um, not because of what you get in the sacrament, but because of what you are doing for God. You re it's the dumbest thing ever when you think about it. But and it goes kind of downhill from there. It was crazy, and like the ordinary people, they had no idea because. You know, these people were, you know, living to, working to survive. They had more free time, actually, than we do, but that's a whole different topic. But they, they you know, they were working hard, but they weren't, they didn't go to school. They, they might, they might learn to do math, arithmetic enough to do business. And that's kind of it. Or whatever, you know, whatever education they got, they actually got in church. And how much was that when it's not in your language? So... And that's where we'll stop for this week. But yeah, so that was all new. But yeah, and you know, Luther says, you know, don't don't read my stuff because it's junk. But then every other book he writes, he goes, this is my best book. <laughs> like, okay, would we'll pick one? Uh, but his best thing, and I'm thinking maybe our next Bible study after we do Psalms is going to be maybe the Augsburg Confession and the Apology, because um, we don't read it much anymore. 
And we'll talk about that if you guys are interested in it. Uh, because you'll see where all these differences were and then how it was regained in the Reformation. Uh, and it's all from the Bible, so it will be in the Bible anyway. You'll, you'll be doing some, a uh, lot of Bible reading. So next week we will talk about Tentatio. Uh, and then we will actually begin the psalm. We'll do actual background of the psalm, some themes. Well, I'll keep it brief. And then I'll, we'll go from there.